Great to see you all here this morning. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. We had a fabulous lineup of speakers, and we do again today. So I'm here, as always, to invite you to turn off your cell phones. If you haven't done that yet. Uh, but then and to invite to uh, the stage one of our students who has been instrumental in working with the committee on making the symposium the great event that it is. Spencer O'Gara, who is a history major and a security studies minor, uh, will now come to introduce our speaker for this morning. Welcome, Spencer. Good morning. Um, nice to see you guys got up at nine to be here. Uh, like Dean Perry said, my name is Spencer O'Gara. I'm a senior here. I'm a history major with security studies minor, and I've had the pleasant opportunity for the last year to be on the symposium committee. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Jeremy Scahill, who is an award-winning investigative journalist and frequent contributor to The Nation, where he reports on war contractors. Widely viewed as one of the world's leading experts on privatized warfare, Scahill has testified before Congress on the use of military forces in U.S. war zones, and his reporting has been used in numerous congressional investigations. Formerly a senior producer and correspondent for nationally syndicated radio and TV show Democracy Now!, he has reported extensively from Iraq through the Clinton, Bush, and Obama, Obama administrations. Jeremy Scahill has won numerous awards, including the prestigious George Polk Award and numerous Project Censored Awards. In addition to the nation, nation, he has written for the Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, O Magazine, Z Magazine, In These Times, The Progressive, and many other publications. Please welcome Jeremy Scahill. I'm actually astonished to see so many young people here after what I witnessed on your Greek row last night. <laughs> when I got in, Spencer was driving me there, and I'm like, am I going to be staying at one of these houses? I saw a woman doing a keg stand in front of I mean, I'm not going to point you out, but you are here. I did see you last night. Um, I, had a, uh, I had a disturbing moment at breakfast this morning when I, uh, I, I came down, and I look in, and I see a former CIA officer, uh, Tony Jordan, sitting there. The last thing I'm going to do is eat my Wheaties next to a former CIA operative. I was like, put a little powder in my Wheaties and I'm not here to give this talk. And then later he did actually threaten me. So, anyway, Tony, great to see you. I see you there in the back. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here at Westminster. In fact, when I, when I saw that John Rizzo, uh, who spoke yesterday, was going to be here and Jay Johnson, I thought they had made a mistake in, in inviting me. I mean, there's the, the press is often considered on the other side of... Uh, people who were intimately involved with covert CIA operations or are running uh, Homeland Security, but I think it's a testament to the Westminster community that you uh, put together a symposium of this nature that brings together uh, various people operating within the same arenas, but coming at it from uh, very different perspectives. Uh, you know, I, um, one of the things that Spencer didn't mention is that the, the current work that I'm doing, I, um, I started a news organization that's been publishing for about a year now called The Intercept, and um, you can find it at theintercept.com. Uh, and it was an organization I founded with Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, the two journalists who originally flew to Hong Kong uh, to meet with Edward Snowden, who then provided them with an enormous quantity of top secret government documents, primarily from the National Security Agency, where he was a contractor at the time. He had previously been in the CIA and before that uh, in the U.S. military. And uh, one of the founding principles of our organization was, to, was that we were going to be an inherently adversarial news organization. Uh, and, and it's not that we believe that what we're doing is something uh, that should be viewed as unusual. It's an unfortunate reality that it is unusual, because right now uh, in Washington, D.C., you have a very cozy relationship uh, between those in official power and those in media power. Uh, Vice President Joe Biden uh, annually hosts a party uh, where journalists uh, sort of hang out with government officials and they play with super soakers. Like Chuck Todd is running around the lawn, like squirting the Deputy Secretary of State at Joe Biden's house. And, uh, you know, there's great crossover 
between powerful journalists and powerful government officials. They are their children's godparents. They hang out at the same cocktail parties. And that has an impact on the kind of reporting that is done at the highest levels of power, where certain uh, facts uh, that are uncovered by journalists are withheld because of a cozy relationship between the press and those in power. And our principle, our founding principle, was that we were going to view the Democrats and Republicans in exactly the same way and hold them to the same standard. If we believe that uh, excesses or a particular program under Bush deserved uh, intense scrutiny, if President Obama then continued that program, the scrutiny has to continue with it. Uh, you know, I don't consider myself a Democrat or a Republican. I'm a journalist. And uh, there's no such thing as Democratic cruise missiles and Republican cruise missiles. There are American cruise missiles. And when they land somewhere, uh, it shouldn't matter who's in power the way that we interpret the impact of those missiles. And that's true of counterterrorism policy in general, but it's also true of domestic security and civil liberties policy. Uh, one of the, the things that I uh, have concluded after, I've been a journalist for about 20 years and started uh, reporting from Iraq in the 1990s when Saddam Hussein was uh, in power. And uh, I've been to Yemen many times, I've been to Mogadishu and other places in Somalia, I've spent extensive time in Afghanistan, I covered the wars in Yugoslavia. Uh, and I've come to a conclusion that what is described as uh, U.S. counterterrorism policy is actually undermining uh, our security uh, and undermining our safety. And I'll tell you some stories to defend that position, and I'm sure there are people that will disagree with me, uh, but I'm giving you my perspective as someone who has been on the ground in these countries and has uh, made a, a central priority in his reporting trying to go to the other side of the barrel of the gun of, of U.S. foreign or counterterrorism policy and trying to understand the impact that our policies are having around the world. But before I do that, I want to give some political context to the moment that we are in right now, where we have this growing presence of uh, ISIS in Syria and Iraq, where you have an increased number of uh, Westerners that are either seeking to go and join ISIS or are uh, plotting in within the borders of Western countries. Uh, you have uh, the Egyptian government now being run uh, by a dictator. Once again, it's Mubarak after Mubarak with General Sisi, and yet this administration has embraced uh, General Sisi despite the fact that he is uh, merciless towards dissidents, atrocious uh, toward reporters. Uh, currently, there are Al Jazeera journalists who have been uh, charged with crimes against the Egyptian state. Uh, for simply doing their job as reporters, and they are now in prison, and this is an administration in Egypt that has the uh, full support uh, of the U.S. government. In Yemen right now, which is the poorest country in the Arab world, is already facing an existential crisis because of a massive water shortage in the country, uh, is being bombed on a daily basis, uh, primarily by the Saudis, uh, using weapons that they purchased or were given by the United States, uh, also being backed by uh, Qatar and other uh, Emirati uh, interests. This is largely a proxy war that the U.S. is, is fighting uh, against Iran, uh, but the Yemeni people are in the middle of it and are suffering uh, tremendously as a result of it. There's no government to speak of in Yemen. There's no civilian infrastructure. Uh, there's no humanitarian infrastructure. And the country is being mercilessly uh, pummeled as part of what amounts to a proxy war. How did we get to this position from the time that uh, George Bush and Barack Obama engaged in a transition, a peaceful transition, as we're fortunate to have in this country, uh, of power from one Republican president then to a Democratic president? You have to remember that Barack Obama was uh, a foreign policy novice when he was running for president, outside of the experience that he gained from his personal life as an international figure who had spent time uh, in very diverse places growing up and came from a family of mixed heritage. Uh, but his foreign policy experience was almost entirely based on his short tenure in the Senate and his work on the Foreign Relations Committee. And he did a lot of studying in a short period of time in the Senate, but foreign policy was not his strong suit outside of uh, staking out a very carefully crafted position in opposition to the Iraq War. And a lot of people on the right, the political right, 
portrayed Obama as a naive uh, dove who was against all wars. And of course, if you read his speech that he gave in October of 2002 in Chicago, uh, opposing the Iraq war, he said, I'm not opposed to all wars, I'm opposed to dumb wars, to stupid wars. And he, in that speech, reserved uh, the authorities, if he were to ever hold a higher office, to go to war. And he has gone to war. He's gone to war many times as president. Uh, but many of his wars haven't been declared by Congress or uh, claimed as actual wars. He adopted what uh, some call the way of the scalpel. Uh, and it doesn't mean that he was, he's any less belligerent of a president than George Bush was. It just means that he's opted to use different methods to attempt to achieve what is effectively the same goals. So when Obama was running for president, uh, yes, he was, he was uh, uh, constantly coming back to uh, the disaster that was the invasion of Iraq. And, and, it, and it, it, it uh, inspired a tremendous amount of support, particularly from young people, many of whom were going to be voting for the first time. And there was this uh, perception that Obama was, in fact, going to be this transformative figure, not just because he stood a chance to become the first African-American president, but because he was articulating a vision that sounded like a breath of fresh air to many people in the center and left of the country. And in fact, the, what was the anti-war movement largely was, at that point, was largely folded into the Obama campaign because people on the left, or liberals, put so much faith in his ability to you know, fix what was perceived to be this atrocious mess that had been created by eight years of George Bush and, and Dick Cheney. So when Obama finally gets the nomination and defeats Hillary Clinton, once he was the Democratic nominee, he was then entitled to receive a, uh, a fairly intensive and expansive security brief uh, from the Director of National Intelligence. At the time, it was Mike McConnell. So McConnell uh, and some of his aides fly out to uh, Chicago to meet with then-Senator Obama, who had just won the Democratic nomination, and they briefed him on the threats that the United States was currently facing around the world. And of course, you know, Afghanistan was uh, the issue that Obama uh, would use as his wedge issue against John McCain. He was fond of saying in his, you know, tin can campaign speeches that, you know, uh, John, you know, John McCain, uh, you know, says that that he'll chase terrorism to the gates of hell, but he won't even chase Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. And he would say it over and over and over again. Uh, and, and and so when McConnell came out, he knew that Obama already was intent on surging in Afghanistan, but he wanted to put on the senator's radar the fact that current U.S. intelligence assessments indicated that uh, outside of the Pakistani Taliban and other militant groups in Pakistan, the single greatest threat to security in what they call the U.S. homeland uh, was coming from Yemen, uh, from a group called Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And they also briefed the president, or excuse me, the senator at the time, uh, that Al-Qaeda in Somalia was reconstituting under the banner of uh, Al-Shabaab, and that those threats were going to need to be confronted, and that diplomacy was only going to be a small part of it, that, they, that he would have to be prepared to engage in actual fighting in those countries, and what the, the term they like to use, taking the fight to the enemy in Yemen and Somalia. Now, Obama had campaigned against the idea of large-scale troop deployments. And so what ended up happening when he finally won the presidency is an all-star team of uh, people from the intelligence community and at the highest levels of the military special operations communities present to the new president um, an option for how to deal with terrorism around the world that would allow him to A, keep his promise that he wasn't going to engage in large-scale troop deployments, particularly new ones, um, and B, was going to be politically expedient for a president that had campaigned on closing Guantanamo. Why do I say politically expedient? If Barack Obama was to implement a policy where they were going to go in and snatch terror suspects from Somalia or Yemen, the question would be where do you put them? Uh, they, they didn't want to put them in Guantanamo, of course. Uh, there was great controversy about trying them in civilian federal courts in the U.S., which ultimately is what the Obama administration says is its position. Um, but the military and the CIA were offering a sort of different solution, which is uh, kill them in drone strikes. And we can um, 
radically expand the operations against terrorists in Yemen, in Pakistan, and in Somalia, where you will have very limited, minimal presence of U.S. Special Operations Forces or CIA personnel to enable these operations. And very quickly, this sort of all-star team of people, General David Petraeus, uh, who would go on to become the uh, commander of U.S. Central Command and then ultimately become the CIA director, uh, Admiral William McRaven, who um, would become the commander of the elite Joint Special Operations Command and then the head of SOCOM Special Operations Command, uh, Stanley McChrystal, uh, who at the time Obama came to office was the, uh, had just finished his tour as the commander of JSOC and now was in the intelligence wing of the, uh, of the Pentagon and, and became a very influential figure in, in the uh, expanded use of special operations forces in Afghanistan, sort of a war within the war. And, and so Obama was sold on this idea that if you, if you go the way of the knife, the way of the scalpel, and you really um, let the drone operations off the leash, uh, that we're going to be able to disrupt and take out these terror networks, systematically mow through and kill uh, all of these people that are plotting against the United States, and you're not going to have to take a single prisoner. And so what effectively happened is that uh, President Obama outsourced uh, his counterterrorism program to the darkest of the dark ops force, uh, forces within the CIA uh, and the military, meaning the Joint Special Operations Command. And, and he loosened some of the rules for the CIA in their drone strikes inside of Pakistan and allowed the CIA to start doing something called signature strikes, which basically means that the CIA was allowed to target people even if they did not know their identities, but target them based on their uh, metadata trails and who they're in contact with. So if this phone is in contact with this phone and that phone happens to be in contact with five other phones of people that we believe are involved with, Tahriki Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban, and they're in this particular region of Pakistan, and they're a military-aged male, we're going to assume they're up to no good and they are fair game for the CIA to target, even if they don't have positive identification. Uh, the military was operating under much stricter guidelines at the time, uh, under the uh, 2001 AUMF, the Authorization for the Use of Military Force, which was just 60 words, uh, and, and, and it was passed right after 9-11, and it empowered the president to deploy U.S. forces anywhere uh, where there were people that were believed to have been involved with the 9-11 attacks. Uh, but when Obama took power, many of the people that were coming of age as terrorists were toddlers when 9-11 had happened. And, and yet the same law is, is what's on the books today and is what is used to justify strikes against people, including those who were toddlers on 9-11, and that's why there's a debate right now about whether or not the AUMF should be repealed or adjusted, and this is a, a political sort of juggling match that the White House is doing with Congress. Um, but, the, but the point I'm getting at is that the military was required to get a positive ID uh, and have near certainty that civilians were not going to be killed in its strikes. And this created a turf war between the CIA and the military's Joint Special Operations Command over who would have supremacy when it came to the high-value killing campaign. Uh, the CIA and the military had long had a rivalry. Uh, it exploded after 9-11. The CIA felt that the military under Donald Rumsfeld was uh, attempting to get too deep into the spy business, that they were expanding the resources that they had for intelligence gathering, that they were using obscure military doctrines to, quote, prepare the battle space. And Rumsfeld's interpretation was that the entire world was the battle space, so he started sending in clandestine or covert teams of Defense Department personnel, special operators, to effectively act like spies. The CIA started to expand its role in bumping people off uh, in a variety of countries. And the military felt that, uh, and Rumsfeld felt, that the CIA was taking too many of their top-tier special ops assets and using them for CIA operations. On the flip side, Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld viewed the CIA as a liberal think tank at the time, which is hilarious to anyone that knows the history of the CIA, but the analytical division of the CIA was viewed as essentially a kind of liberal discussion group. And, and so what Rumsfeld did is he put a, a guy named Stephen Cambone, who was a well-known uh, neoconservative, put Stephen Cambone in charge of an office called the Office of Special Plans. And the special plans basically were, let's, let's uh, cherry pick intelligence, 
raw intelligence from the field and use it to make cases that bolster our agenda of what we want to do, which is why you saw this immediate focus on Iraq being connected to 9-11, which of course was you know, a ludicrous notion but for a, a, a sprinkling of random occurrences. Iraq had nothing to do operationally with 9-11, and yet Iraq became the major focus. And part of the way uh, that Colin Powell ended up at the United Nations giving that speech about Iraq's connection to 9-11 was because Rumsfeld, Stephen Cambone, Cheney's people uh, had gone in and cherry-picked uh, intelligence to make it seem like there was this strong case, when in reality the CIA people that had been studying this for a long time uh, and had been relegated to the sidelines of being a liberal discussion group were watching in astonishment as Colin Powell gave that speech. And Colin Powell said that it was the lowest point of, of his career. And I think when he actually gives a full speech about what happened there, we're going to learn a very dark set of secrets about uh, how it was that you put uh, Powell in that position to effectively mislead the entire world in an effort to justify a bombing campaign against uh, Iraq. But you had this CIA military divide that has existed for a long time. And it's not that there isn't cooperation between those two agencies, of course there is. But when it came to the being the tip of the spear uh, post 9-11, there was a turf war. And that turf war is extended, has extended to this day. Uh, in fact, the Wall Street Journal just did a, a piece the other day uh, saying that the uh, White House is now contemplating creating a joint command between the CIA and the military to run the drone program, which military and CIA people are all laughing at because it is so ridiculous that those two entities would just sit and do this together. The CIA has its way of doing business, military has its way of doing business, and a lot of this is politics and leaks played out in the New York Times and the Washington Post. But o Obama really embraced the paramilitary side of the CIA and uh, the special operations forces within JSOC and US Special Operations Command and let them off the leash. Beginning in December of 2009, uh, the United States initiates a covert air war uh, in Yemen. The first strike that happened was on December 17, 2009. Uh, Admiral McRaven, the head of the Joint Special Operations Command, had told the President and his advisors that they had located an Al-Qaeda training camp uh, in a small section of rural Yemen called El Majula and that they were witnessing the construction um, you know, of underground facilities, that they had a known uh, senior Al-Qaeda figure that was present in the area, and they wanted authorization to strike. There had only been one other US strike in Yemen since 9-11, and that was in November of 2002, when President Bush authorized a drone strike uh, in Yemen. It was the first drone strike outside of uh, Afghanistan at that point. And from 2002 until December 2009, there had not been any uh, U.S. strikes that we know of or that were reported inside of Yemen. So it was a big deal that the, pre that the new president was contemplating ex opening a new front um, in the fight against terrorism. And so they briefed the president. And in fact, Jay Johnson, who's going to be here later, uh, signed off on this strike because at the time he was the Depart Defense Department's general counsel. And when I tell you this story, I hope a student asked Jay Johnson about signing off on this and how he felt about this strike. Uh, they, didn't have, they didn't have drones to do the strike at the time because the CIA had most of the assets already allocated in Pakistan because Obama was widening the sandbox, so to speak, where they could strike. Uh, so instead of using drones, which are a much more precise weapon, uh, they elected to use Tomahawk cruise missiles uh, that would be launched from a, a ship. And they rained down cruise missiles on this village of al and among the munitions that they, they used in this operation uh, were cluster bombs, which are uh, arguably should, are banned under international conventions. They're effectively flying landmines. The United States is one of only a handful of countries that still, and President Obama just reiterated this last week, still reserve the right to use these things. I've seen their aftermath in Yugoslavia and elsewhere. It's essentially a, a, a flying landmine that will shred uh, human beings or animals into ground beef when they hit. Uh, I saw the aftermath of a cluster bombing in the niche marketplace in Serbia in 1999, uh, where cluster bombs were dropped in the middle of the green market uh, at noon. And you couldn't tell what the cuts of meat were for sale and what the body parts were. Uh, that's what cluster bombs do. So they, they, they hit this, what they're told is a Al-Qaeda training site. And what happened then is that the Yemeni government 
puts out a press release the next day saying that Yemeni fighter jets had conducted airstrikes in Al Majla against an Al Qaeda training facility and they had killed 14 um, Al Qaeda members and it was a very successful strike. Um, the US, when asked about it, uh, referred all questions to the Yemeni government. Uh, and the, uh, the US then sent a telegram to the Yemeni dictator at the time, Ali Abdullah Saleh, congratulating him on his victory against a uh, terrorist training camp inside of Yemen. Uh, a Yemeni journalist named uh, Abdullah Haider Shaya went to Al Majla and photographed the munitions that were used that clearly said made in the United States. And in our film, we show part of parts of those munitions, which are still there to this day. And there are unexploded ordnance that are still there to this day. Uh, he took photos of, of this and then sent them to Amnesty International. And Amnesty International then had munitions experts look at them. And it was beyond a shadow of a doubt clear that these were not uh, munitions that the Yemeni Air Force was in possession of and that in fact the only country that was capable of doing this kind of an operation was in fact the United States. And, and then it became a sort of scandal and it ended up hitting the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post that the Obama administration had authorized this attack inside of Yemen. And eventually the White House did confirm uh, that it was behind the strike, but it was only after it became so ridiculous to continue denying it or referring to the Yemeni government that the administration was forced to do it. What it, what it turns out, and I went there and investigated this and spoke with witnesses, survivors, and others, uh, is that the guy that the military was claiming was this senior Al-Qaeda figure was in fact an old veteran of the Mujahideen Wars in Afghanistan. Yemen sent more fighters to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets than any other Arab country. Uh, they were on the same side as the United States uh, in Afghanistan during that war and Osama bin Laden for that matter. Uh, and this guy was revered in Yemeni society, as all of the old Mujahideen are, as sort of freedom fighters. And he happened to be from this one tribal area. They were not building a camp. There was a water well that was being built. Now, were there people there that hate the United States, you know, or, or would say death to America or anything? I'm sure. I mean, you can, you can talk to people in the Egyptian government today who, who, who are being supported by the United States, and they'll whisper you behind the scenes, we can't stand the Americans. You know, they, they, they let the Israelis do everything. Chatter is chatter. Are they actually involved with terrorism? In the case of this particular village, I don't believe that there was a training camp there, based on my reporting, and I don't believe that there was anything even vaguely resembling an imminent threat to the United States. Was it faulty intel? I don't know. Was it the military wanting to have an opening salvo that would allow for an expanded covert campaign inside of Yemen? I, I don't know. Those are questions for Jay Johnson or for President Obama. Uh, but what I do know, is that there were 40 people, more than 40 people killed, three dozen of whom were women and children. And we have video of the aftermath of the bodies of babies being pulled out of the rubble in this strike. And uh, kids died in the weeks after from stepping on uh, cluster munitions that were unexploded. Uh, it was a, a horrifying scene. And in fact, Jay Johnson is quoted in, in one of the books that have been written by elite journalists with access to the White House as saying that, that when, when they saw the aftermath of that strike, had he been Catholic, he would have gone to confession. So, so a student should ask Jay Johnson about this, the Modula strike, and why he signed off on it, and if he thinks it was the right thing to do, given that we know that it killed a couple of dozen women and children. Uh, that, though, was uh, the beginning of what would become a very intense uh, air war, uh, where, well, war is, is probably not the right term because it's, it was the United States hitting Yemen regularly with uh, Hellfire missiles from drones. Uh, from 2002 until today, more than 800 people have been killed in drone strikes in Yemen, and yet we are told that there are only uh, a little over a dozen people on the kill list in Yemen. Who are the 700 and, you know, 80-something other people that are being killed in these strikes. They're referred to as militants, facilitators, mid-level supporters. I don't think any of them, with the exception of a few hundred hardcore AQAP people, who definitely need to be dealt with, who definitely want to attack the United States, with the exception of a small core of people there, 
the overwhelming majority of radical Islamists, whatever term you want to use for it in Yemen, don't pose any existential threat to the United States. Don't pose any imminent threat to the United States. Don't pose any immediate threat to the United States. Those are all the standards by which President Obama says uh, drone strikes are conducted. It's an imminent threat. But they redefined imminent. In their own leaked white paper from the Department of Justice, the word imminent is, is defined in such a way so that it means imminent does not require a known threat any time in the immediate future. It, I mean, you guys are smart, you're college students. Does that sound like imminent to you? Imminent to me means it's going to happen. And, and, and we need to disrupt it. But they redefined their own terms so as to mean that if anyone was on the phone with someone that they think was a terrorist, that person's likely to be involved with terrorist activity. And if we kill them, it's, it's totally fine. Now, I believe nations have a right to self-defense. I believe that you know, nations have a right to confront terrorism. What I think we've done in Yemen is the exact opposite. I think because we've killed uh, so many civilians in strikes, because we've had so many cases uh, where journalists have gone to the scene and discovered that what we were told is not true, that we are actually aiding uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and other groups uh, in their cause by giving them propaganda. And I think that the, uh, the costs of conducting these so-called targeted strikes uh, far outweigh any benefit that we as a society would gain from specific individuals being killed. Uh, I think the same is true of the entire war in Afghanistan. The, we are now at a point in that war where we have our most elite forces in the world uh, hunting down and fighting local militants, not Al-Qaeda leadership, not Taliban leadership, but local militants who took up arms because we were there, the way that they took up arms when the Soviets were there. We've gotten ourselves into the middle of a civil war and a, a few thousand Americans have died and tens of thousands of Afghans have died. And at the end of the day, when the United States pulls out, although Obama's gonna keep in place a special operations strike force that's gonna to continue to do drone strikes and night raids and other things. But when we pull out, everything is going to remain as it was. The Taliban are gonna control huge swaths of territory. Uh, you're going to have corrupt warlords that eventually sort of consolidate their power in different regions of the country. And you will have a small green zone type operation in Afghanistan that will depend entirely on the support of Western governments, primarily the United States, uh, Britain and Germany to maintain even a vague semblance of legitimacy. Uh, why did we do all of this? We claimed that it was because we wanted to go after the people that plotted the 9-11 attacks. Part of the 9-11 attacks were plotted in Hamburg, Germany. Part of them were plotted in different, er in different countries of Germany. Was Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan? Yeah, Osama bin Laden was in Afghanistan. But the Taliban government, and I spoke to the Taliban, who, the guy who was the Taliban foreign minister at the time, Muta Wakil, and he told me, we uh, told the United States that we would hand over Osama bin Laden uh, to a Muslim country that has a Sharia law system. They wanted to hand Osama bin Laden over to Saudi Arabia. Now we can look at that and poo-poo and say, oh, Sharia law, he's not going to get away, blah, blah, blah. The Saudis and the, and the U.S. are extremely tight. If the priority was getting bin Laden, you can tell the Taliban guys anything you want, and then you snatch bin Laden. They didn't want bin Laden at that time in that way. They wanted to go to war and crush the Taliban government. And I, I understand that. They were reprehensible, atrocious people. I still was against the United States going in. And I don't like regime change. I don't think we have any business doing it. Um, but I understood the logic of it. That, 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 that was a necessary action not to protect America, but to protect the agenda that people like Rumsfeld and Cheney came into power with. They came into power with an agenda to redraw maps. Uh, to uh, elevate forces that had been sidelined under uh, Clinton. They wanted to reimagine the executive branch as effectively a dictatorship within the U.S. government over foreign policy, intelligence policy, and military policy. It was, the, it was the legacy of Rumsfeld and Cheney going back many decades. They believed in the idea of the unitary executive, which was enshrined in, in the early Federalist Papers, and, and they felt that Congress's only function in any of this should be to fund it. They weren't interested in Congress having an oversight role. They weren't interested in Congress uh, being able to ask questions at hearings. 
They didn't believe that anyone except the executive branch of office had any business making these decisions. They didn't need the authorization for the use of military force. They say Article 2 of the Constitution, Commander-in-Chief Clause, we can run the, 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 the board all we want. And so you know, these guys then embarked on this mission to elevate the role of the darkest dark ops forces. A huge private contracting boon happened where Conveniently, companies politically connected to the Cheneys uh, got enormous contracts. Uh, and I mean, this isn't a conspiracy theory. This was part of the way that Donald Rumsfeld described uh, the Pentagon when he first became defense secretary uh, under Bush. He had been defense secretary. He was both the youngest and the oldest defense secretary in, in, in US history. When Rumsfeld, he gave a major speech the day before 9-11, where he basically talked about uh, the Pentagon bureaucracy. He compared the Pentagon bureaucracy to the Iron Curtain and the Soviet Union and said that it needed to be dismantled, which is eerie given the fact that a missile or a plane hit the Pentagon the next day. Uh, but Rumsfeld you know, uh, lays out this vision for privatizing core functions of the Defense Department. And, and you know, they, they, once 9-11 happened, they implemented their agenda and went, full force with it. And then we have the Iraq disaster. You know, I, I, I was speaking earlier to one of our distinguished speakers here who was on the NSC uh, during the Reagan and H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush administrations. And I was saying to him, you know, these guys were much smarter about Iraq than the crew that came in uh, with George W. Bush. Uh, they understood that taking out Saddam Hussein would mean that you open a box that you, you aren't going to be able to close. Uh, and there was a reason why uh, Bush and Schwarzkopf and others, uh, after the first Gulf War in the early 90s, didn't march on Baghdad. And it wasn't because they loved Saddam, although they had been very close to him. When he was his most brutal, he was very chummy with the United States. When he was gassing the Kurds, he was doing it with US weapons in the 80s. Reagan's administration took him off the list of, of nations uh, that uh, are state sponsors of, of terrorism because it was ge geostrategically important to the United States because of Iran. So all, all this whole chess game had been going on for a very long time. Rumsfeld actually gave Saddam Hussein a pair of golden cowboy spurs. Uh, I, I saw them in the Saddam Museum in Iraq before the, the invasion as, as a sort of friendship gesture from Ronald Reagan uh, at the time. But, but, Bush, but Bush, George H.W. Bush, they understood taking out Saddam is going to have far-reaching consequences. So they left him in power. They, the, the view was, you know, he's a, he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, and he's someone that we can, we understand where he's coming from. So they didn't care about the Iraqi people as much as they cared about their own, uh, or about U.S. geostrategic interests. And Saddam was good for U.S. geostrategic interests in, in many ways. When Cheney and Rumsfeld come into power then, they, they make Saddam, and the, the, the Hitler analogy always comes up, they, they make Saddam out to be the greatest threat to world peace at the time. And then they go in and they do exactly what George H.W. Bush, Brent Scowcroft, other people had warned them uh, against doing. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, uh, I was in Iraq uh, on and off uh, for years, from 1997 to 2003, leading up to the invasion. And the last time I saw Tarek Aziz, who was the, basically he was Iraq's only kind of voice to the outside world for many, many years. He was the deputy prime minister of Iraq and he was the foreign minister and, and, and held various positions and he spoke English and he wasn't a Muslim, he was a Coptic Christian. And, uh, and always when I would meet with him, he would say, oh, the US can never beat Saddam, you know, they'll, they'll be committing suicide at the gates of Baghdad, constantly just bloviating, blah, 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 propaganda regime. The last time I saw him though was at his house uh, about two weeks before the U.S. bombing began in, in March of uh, 2003. And he was in his pajamas and house slippers and he would always smoke a cigar and he had these big like run DMC glasses. And, uh, and, and he sat down and said, you know, the U.S. can overthrow Saddam. They can crush the Ba'ath Party. You can take the country. Um, but you will be opening a Pandora's box that you will never be able to close. And, and what he was referring to was Iranian influence in Iraq. What he was referring to was the presence of armed jihadist groups in Iraq, which had never been the case under Saddam's overwhelmingly secular, brutal uh, period of governance. Uh, and, and, and he was totally right. To the point where now in Iraq, uh, a majority of Iraqis say it was better when Saddam Hussein was president. And, and this was an incredibly brutal regime. 
they, I, I, I met someone who had his, his tongue cut out in Iraq because his son uh, told his second grade teacher that his father was smarter than Saddam Hussein. And then operatives from the Ba'ath Party showed up at their house and they, they took him and they did a surgical procedure to remove his tongue for having told, and who knows if he even said it. This is the word of a second grade kid and it ends up with his dad's tongue cut out. So for Iraqis to say it was better under Saddam means it's really horrible right now. And, and now we see ISIS is uh, rising up in Iraq. And of course we all watch the, the, I knew James Foley, the journalist, one of the journalists who was, uh, who was beheaded. Uh, you know, it's, it's horrifying to those of us in the media community how many journalists are being killed around the world. Uh, but if we don't understand and examine where ISIS came from, if we don't understand the way that the United States has inadvertently aided the rise of ISIS, then we're going to keep repeating this history. ISIS's core military command in Iraq is not made up of Jihad John. It's not made up of Westerners who came wanting to cut heads off and take Yazidi women as slaves. It's largely made up of former Ba'athist military commanders, who many of whom were actually trained by the United States in the 1980s. One of the people who was the, the, the lead strategist for ISIS's military strategy in Iraq was a guy named Izzat Ibrahim al-Duri al-Takridi, who was the, he, my understanding is he was killed a couple of months ago in an airstrike, but he was the most senior official from the previous regime, from Saddam's regime, he was the king of clubs on the deck of cards that was not caught. And he made a deal with the core kind of radical element, uh, the ideological element of ISIS to provide them with military know-how, understanding, consulting, command structure um, in return for getting back territory that they had lost as a result of the U.S. invasion and occupation uh, in um, Anbar province, in Mosul, in northern parts of, of Iraq. It was, it was very much a, a wedding of convenience between the former secular Ba'athist military commanders and ISIS. And they realized that by uh, adopting ISIS's propaganda model and allowing ISIS to kind of take the lead in making these grotesque videos and trying to recruit Westerners, that the, the combination of their, their military know-how with the fact that the U.S. abandoned so much gear, weapons, vehicles in Iraq, they knew how to operate all of these things, the, the, the marriage of these two things was the power of nightmares, which is ISIS, and then actual military know-how of U.S. trained uh, military commanders. So it's not that the United States created ISIS. Uh, it's that the, the mistakes that the United States made, decisions that were made of, of convenience decades earlier, end up blowing up in our face. This isn't just my position on this. Uh, you can go online and watch uh, Mike Flynn, who is one of the most important figures in the evolution of the U.S. intelligence and counterterrorism uh, complex, saying almost the exact same thing the other day, that the United States inadvertently aided the rise of ISIS. So, you know, we're, we, we, we're as a society, when it comes to counterterrorism, we, we end up becoming rake steppers. The, the rake is always in the same place in the backyard, and every day we go out and we step on it and wax us in the face. It, this, this happens over and over, Afghanistan, now Iraq, and we don't learn our lessons. So the, the Obama legacy in all of this is that, and, and I think that you know, for all that Dick Cheney attacks President Obama and portrays Obama as you know, a socialist who's gonna, you know, opening America up to attack, uh, I, I, I think that Cheney privately thanks God every day that Obama was president and not John McCain because Obama has been able to continue programs that uh, McCain would have never been able to get away with. Asserting the right to, to assassinate a US citizen in a drone strike, pfft, John McCain, try that one. Obama gets 70% of self-identified liberals to say, I'm fine with that. Uh, all of these authorities to strike in Yemen, strike in Somalia, strike throughout, now throughout North Africa, the expansion of uh, drone bases, the expansion of the military budget, all of these would have been politically contentious issues if a Republican was in, was in office. But what Obama has been able to do is to normalize and legitimize the core principles, save for the rendition and torture program, uh, that Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld operated under when they first began to create the architecture of the response to 9-11. It's, it's sort of stunningly brilliant that on the one hand, Obama has won the Nobel Peace Prize, and on the other hand, has uh, conducted three to five times more drone strikes than President Bush did during his entire term in office and gotten self-identified liberals to support it. But, but, but here's, this, this is an example that shows the bankruptcy of American politics. 
when, when we have this next election, let's say a Republican wins, and a Republican starts doing the exact same things Obama did, let's see how many Democrats are answering the phone and saying, oh yeah, we totally support this. It's why I said at the beginning, there's no such thing as Democratic cruise missiles and Republican cruise missiles. If you go around and you ask most members of Congress whether they support Program X, it will depend on whose program it is, not on the actual details of it. And that's no way to set our foreign policy. It's no way to set our accountability policy. It, it ultimately leads to a reality where political agendas are more important to our national security in terms of how we respond to threats uh, than the actual threats themselves. And at the end of the day, how do you get into power in this country? We have legalized corruption. It's called campaign finance. Corporations purchase elections in this country. In, 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 you know, in Nigeria and other places throughout history, it's always been whoever has the biggest suitcase of cash drops it off and sort of things get done that way. But here we, we're so sophisticated that we've legalized bribery. You know, I think that members of Congress and the president should have to wear the logos of all of the corporations that sponsored them, like NASCAR racers, you know, when they drive around. And then we'll just, we all can understand exactly what's happening. You know, the, the, the war industry, it's fascinating to watch, and it'll be a fascinating thing to watch during this election cycle. And, and I think they're probably trying to figure out what the hell's going on, seeing Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders at the, at the top of the, their respective party races. Um, but the war industry almost always correctly picks the winner of the presidential campaign. And if you go back and look at it, uh, when, when it was clear that Obama was going to win, money from the war industry goes, tilts a, like one or two percent in favor of the Democrats when it you know, seemed like uh, George Bush was going to win against John Kerry in 2004. The war money started shifting back toward Bush. They almost always have a good read on who's going to be president. What's interesting is that in the, in the previous election cycles when Ron Paul, you know, the, the former congressman from Texas who's a libertarian, um, father of Rand Paul, when Ron Paul was running for president, in both cycles that he ran for president, he received the single, uh, the, the, the largest number of donations from active duty military personnel of any other candidate, of any candidate running. Ron Paul. Why? Ron Paul was, is an isolationist. He doesn't want the U.S. doing anything with any other country. He doesn't want war. He doesn't want aid. He wants nothing to do with the rest of the world at all. Uh, why is it that he would receive more campaign contributions from active duty military than anyone else? Because he was the one guy saying clearly, I want out of all of this. Who, who's paid the huge price for all of these wars. The American people have not benefited from them. The Afghan people largely have not benefited. The Yemeni people certainly aren't benefiting. The Iraqi people are definitely not benefiting. Huge corporations are the only true beneficiaries of our post 9-11 policies. And we've given up tremendous amounts of basic uh, freedom in pursuit of what? Destroying terrorism? We're never going to destroy terrorism. It's, 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 an un, it's an unending threat that you can inflate or deflate based on your, your particular political perspective or which way the wind is blowing on that day. But the people who have paid the price in this country, military families. And, and, and at times, we totally abandon people that were sent over to fight these wars. I think things are getting better now at the Veterans Administration because some of the scandals have been brought out into the public light. Um, but we have record numbers of suicides uh, among uh, soldiers. Uh, record numbers of domestic violence instances that certainly are you know, in part traceable to post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and, and yet for most of the country, none of this is ever talked about. The only people that are really paying attention to what's happening in Afghanistan right now are, are people whose loved ones are, are deployed. And, and, and at the end of the day, I, you know, the, the, the theme of this is, is sort of the relationship between security, um, you know, and, and liberty. Uh, and I, I, I think those two are definitely intertwined. Um, but also there's a more nuanced way of looking at that, at this, and that is our own fear-driven policies are undermining our security. When we have a watch list system, and, and we, we published, uh, the government was not happy about this, but we published the 168-page government uh, guidebook for how people end up on the watch list. And it's resulted in court cases being overturned of people that were inappropriately put on the no-fly list. I was on the watch list for a while where I was, I, every single time I would come back from out of the country, I would go and have a nice little chat with, you know, the uh, customs people or ICE or, you know, Homeland Security 
Jay Johnson's around, I don't want to talk to him about that. Get, if you can get me off the list, that would be great. Um, but what, what's happening is that we're putting every nugget of information <clears throat> into these databases. One is called the TIDE database, the Terrorist Identities Data Mark Environment. Uh, and people are categorized as KSTs, known or suspected terrorists. Even if they are not known or suspected of being a terrorist, that is their designation if they end up on it. And you can end up on it for one uncorroborated Facebook post or social media post, or something that you said that some analyst somewhere saw, didn't like it, boom, you get designated. This is what the guidance shows that we, we publish. Dead people can be placed on that list. Uh, even knowing that they're dead, they still place them on the list with the idea that someone may want to use their name to conduct a terrorist attack. Like, I'm sure there's some guy right now saying, huh, I'm gonna get on an airplane and I'm gonna change my name to Osama bin Laden and go and get on an airplane, but Osama bin Laden is still on the watch list even though he's dead. Uh, you, you can uh, be put on it based on your phone number being found in the phone of someone who was taken for secondary screening at an airport and their uh, information from their phone has been downloaded. It's also been litigated, litigated, litigated. There is, you have no constitutional rights in, a, in an airport in the United States. If they seize your computer and you have your Gmail open, they can go and look at every single message that you've ever sent. There have been challenges from civil liberties groups and they've lost them all. There are no constitutional rights in an airport. But because we're, we're, we're inundated with all this information and we're downloading people's phones and we're looking at their networks and we're looking at the metadata and we're trying to connect them and then you have people with the same name as someone else and they end up on it, that there's, there's more than a million people right now on that, in that database and growing every day. What that means though is that the FBI counterterrorism agents who are actually looking for the needle in a haystack and are trying to find the people that are actively plotting are drowning in information to the point where they can't separate legitimate hard intel from crap some analyst put into the system last week because he read something on Twitter. And they're drowning in bad information. And it's making it harder to actually target uh, terrorists, actual terrorists, people that want to blow up buildings or kill people in this country or want to kill Americans around the world. So that's, that's one of the consequences of it. But, but also, at the end of the day, the, the Patriot Act and, and what it does to the moral fabric of our country, I think is going to be studied for many generations to come. And, and, and you know, there's this sense, and, I, and I, it's almost always white people that you hear saying it, there's this sense, well, if I, don't, if, 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 you, if I don't have anything to hide, I don't care what they're looking at. Well, they're not profiling you. When we, when we looked at who is watch listed in this country, the number one city with known or suspected terrorists, predictably, New York City. Uh, number three is Chicago, number four is Houston, number five is San Diego. Number two, anyone want to guess? I bet you'd guess a big city, right, Los Angeles? No, Dearborn, Michigan, population 98,000. Why Dearborn, Michigan? Dearborn, Michigan has the largest percentage of uh, self-identified Muslims uh, of any city in the United States. It has the largest percentage and the largest percentage of Arab Americans of any city in the United States. Dearborn, Michigan has been home to exactly one terror plot and it was a white Vietnam War veteran who was plotting to blow up the largest mosque in the United States. This is now being the, the city of Dearborn, whose mayor is actually an Irish guy. Uh, they are now suing the federal government over this after we published it, uh, saying that they, uh, their citizens are being disproportionately targeted because they are Arabs or because they are Muslims. Uh, it is ridiculous to think that there isn't profiling in this country. Every time I've gotten pulled aside at JFK Airport or Newark Airport, and I get taken into that other room, I am always the only white person in there. And I remember a whole family that I was on a plane with from Cairo got detained and I waited to, I was gonna wait to see when they came out and they never came out. I don't know if they were deported, I don't know, I mean, maybe there was something legitimate. Maybe, they, maybe the guy actually did do something. But, but we don't know. What we do know is that the data shows that Muslims are being disproportionately targeted. And in, unless we as a society kind of come to terms with the way we've overreacted in the face of what is a relatively minor threat. More people die from bee stings in this country every year than acts of terrorism. Uh, now, with the exception of Monsanto, no one is suggesting that we go and kill all of the bees, but I think at, you know, at, at the end of the day, we need to do the calculus. Is what we're doing in Yemen, Somalia, in the fight against ISIS, is it ultimately making us more safe or less safe? Uh, is it ultimately disrupting these networks or is it somehow giving them uh, propaganda uh, tools that they can use then to recruit young people from around the world. Um, 
My sense from where I've been on the ground is that we've hit a point where we should have a moratorium on drone strikes in these remote places so that we can do an assessment of who we actually have killed and determine whether or not that policy makes sense. And, and I think in the course of doing that, uh, we would have a, a much more rigorous debate in our society about the theme of this uh, symposium. You know, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, this next generation, uh, all of you, uh, are going to be faced with a, a very interesting and frightening reality. Your entire history is going to be searchable in one form or another because of social media. You will have grown up in an era where technology uh, in, increasingly is uh, leading to a place where we won't need actual human beings to fight on the ground, where we can effectively fight wars with limited footprint and flying robots and drones and uh, eventually they're going to create a you know, RoboCop type figure. And this is real, this is what DARPA does in the Defense Department. But you're, if, if, if you just sort of debate the technology, or if you just sort of look at the, the, the threat of the month, uh, then you miss the broader discussion about our identity as a, as a country. And, and, and the thing I want to leave you with is this idea that empathy is largely absent from our policy discussions. We, we talk about objectives as, as though it's like a widgets that we're creating at the end of the day. If you read PowerPoint presentations from the Defense Department, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's like a product when they're talking about killing. It's the banality of sort of corporate language. Uh, they, 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 it's, it's gross. You know, it makes you feel dirty after reading it. Um, but jur journalists are a, part, a huge part of this problem. And, and you know, I, I mean, living in New York, and our office was two blocks from the World Trade Center, and people were coming in and taking refuge there. And I remember walking around New York, you know, in the weeks following 9-11, and, and people were putting pictures everywhere of their loved ones that they either knew were dead or missing, and, and long notes, and there were all of these monuments that sprouted up all over the city, and there was this incredible sense of oneness in New York. Uh, you know, pe people on the streets were friendlier than they ever had been. Strangers would be hugging, just reading these things. I mean, it was incredible, and we knew the stories of people that died in the World Trade Center. We, to this day, there are films being made and books being written, and we, we're, we're knowing more and more, not just about the events of 9-11, but about the people that died on those days, and, and that's how it should be. We should, those stories should be told. Uh, when, the, when the shootings happen at, at Virginia Tech or, or Sandy Hook, uh, or, or the Boston Marathon bombing happens, we know the stories of the victims. We, we, we know the, the, the picture that the, that the beautiful young boy was blown up at the Boston Marathon, the picture that he had drawn about peace went all over the, all over the world. You know, we heard stories of teachers shielding their students in front of doors, and, and that's, the way, that's the way that journalists should report on these kinds of stories, because it then aided a debate in this country about guns, um, and it also, in the case of Boston, aided a debate about what kinds of trials terrorists should be, uh, what, what types of trials we should subject terrorists to in this country whether they should be rendered somewhere else or we should try to do it in our own court system. But that's good journalism when you tell the actual story. What if, as a society, we, we did the same thing in, in our wars? Uh, and not, I mean, I, think, I, I don't think we do enough to tell the story of soldiers who go to these store, uh, wars and then come back. Um, but we do almost nothing to tell the stories of the people that live on the other side of the missiles. And, you know, we, we, we've ended up in a society where we all know everything about the Kardashians, and we know nothing about the people who are being killed in, in wars that we're all paying for. And I think if we, if we all sort of make it a part of our routine to occasionally dig a little deeper into a story and figure out who was killed in a particular strike, or who was this soldier that, that, that came home and they mentioned for two seconds on the news the other day, then the debate becomes personal to you, even if you don't have a loved one deployed, or relatives from Yemen or Iraq or Syria or, or what have you. Uh, and this, this generation, I think, could go one of two ways. You could get sucked into the vortex of technology, and everything needs to be you know, stated in 140 characters or on Snapchat. Um, or you could say, we want to be different, and, and we want to be the generation that actually takes on the tough moral questions surrounding 
debates about war and peace and civil liberties and security. Uh, but I, I, I believe this generation has the creativity because you, you see it all the time. Um, the question you have is are you going to have the, the sort of moral strength to ask and answer very tough questions? Thank you. describing dismembered parts, a dead body is a dead body, it, whether it's dismembered or not, the death is as much a tragedy of it, as it would be, however. But I have never heard a more succinct nor more truthful, because i got to tell you, I know what was going on. Uh, Jeremy has nailed it. He's nailed it on the head. So it, take it in. Um, as a, as a private citizen, Jeremy, all I can say is keep doing what you're doing. I, I'm afraid I may have done something wrong. I did not expect to hear that from you. But, uh, but, I, but, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored and I look forward to talking to you more. And uh, that's, um, yeah, I really thought you were going to kill me earlier. <laughs> Jeremy Scahill will be in the Culture Science Center Lecture Hall. Uh, please join him there. We also have several other great breakout sessions. You're welcome to join. And then everyone will be back here at 1 o'clock for our 56th Green Lecture with Secretary Jay Johnson. We'll see you back here then.